to my left here is a man who has seen the rise, the fall, and the revitalization of disco in New York, one of the pivotal figures of the whole New York dance music scene. He, he was one of the driving forces together with uh, Joe Closel and Francois Kiwakian behind the legendary Body and Soul Sunday sessions. And yeah, please give Mr. Danny Krivit a very warm welcome. Um, so Danny, you had a very interesting childhood when it comes to music. One could almost say that you didn't find the music, but the music found you. So maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that one. It was probably uh, quite a while before I even realized it. I, I think I took it for granted most of my childhood. I, my, my father was uh, Chet Baker's manager, and my mother was a uh, jazz singer, formed a band with some of his members. And um, then my father went on to uh, start this uh, club in New York called the Ninth Circle, which ran for about 30 years. And uh, it's kind of a hot spot in the village, so I kind of just around all these music people, I, I you know, I, I respected the time, but I didn't realize how influential they would be on me later. Uh, um, like, uh, I met uh, Janis Joplin there, and uh, uh, Jimi Hendrix, uh, John Lennon, Charles Mingus. Um, the, uh, the guy who lived above us in our building was a friend of my father's. He was the uh, vice president of Polydor. And uh, when I just started DJing, um, he kept saying, oh, come up to the office and, you know, give us some records. And uh, it took my time. By the time I got up there, uh, James Brown was the big thing at Polydor, I'm a big uh, uh, fan of his. Uh, he said, well, this used to be all my office, but now it's... Uh, this is now James's office. So let me show you around James's office. And we walk around and he, uh, he gave me, um, uh, he introduced me and he said, um, Danny's a DJ. And, and he said, oh, you gotta give him my new jam, you know? And so he gave me a white label of uh, uh, Get on the Good Foot and Think, Lynn Collins. And I was just you know, kind of amazed, you know, so used to the red label with his face on it. and. Uh, uh, I'm looking at this, you know, like 20 different ways, and uh, uh, he's got his, you know, picture in this white jumpsuit on the cover. And I'm kind of looking at it, and him, and he's, he's actually in the same suit when we're talking. <laughs> but I was, I was pretty struck, and it, it kind of, um, I just started DJing, and I kind of felt like, wow, this is a jump star. I'm, I'm really, you know, feel like this is where I'm going. How, how old were you back then? Uh, I was 14. This was what year? Uh, 71. Yeah. And um, yeah, you, you, you started DJing at your father's place at the Ninth Circle? Yeah. Or? I, I wouldn't have gotten a start that early except it was his place, so uh, I got in uh, pretty young. And then he opened a second place a couple years later, and I was DJ there. So uh, I kind of got over on my age. And except for James Brown, what, what kind of music did you play back then? Uh, I, I definitely was a funky kind of DJ at the time, but um, pretty wide variety. Uh, quite a lot of rock, dance rock was in there. Um, you know, things like uh, uh, Brian Auger and Traffic and uh, um, Exuma and, you know, things like that. And um, from there on, you got to The Loft and David Mancuso, or oh. did this happen <laughs> later? Um, that, that was a bit of a jump later. I, I think the uh, first few years of DJing, um, I, was start, I was really, um, you know, uh, sensitive to the people that I was playing for. And uh, um, I remember they're really starting to dictate to me you know, oh, this is not good, and you know, and I was starting to question my taste, and I, I really felt passionate about a lot of music at that time, and uh, I remember in particular like a song like uh, City Country City by War. I, um, 
he was really into it. And I remember a lot of people saying, you know, what, what are you playing this? You should be, you know, this is for home. Don't, don't bring this again. And I started questioning my taste. And uh, I remember going to the loft and uh, hearing uh, this uh, song there. But now it was, this was the biggest song there. I was going nuts. And I, I really started to realize that, you know, some people are not on the same wa wavelength as me, but now I really feel there's a reason I love that song. And uh, uh, it really reinforced my taste, uh, so I'm pretty confident about what I believe in. Maybe someone else might not like it, but I, I don't second guess myself anymore. And you have the song with you? So um, you yeah. So, uh, and this is still a staple for David Mancuso, right? Who uh, was the DJ yeah. at the loft, or I is think, the DJ at the loft? I think the last time I went there, he played it. But it's it's a terribly long song, <laughs> and it starts off. The name is uh, appropriate because it for some sort of record pool. Or? Yeah, that was the second record pool. Uh, David Bencuso had the first one, and uh, uh, Judy Weinstein used to work for him and some other people, and they all split off and made their own record pool. So maybe you could explain to us what, what a record pool, <laughs> in fact, is. Well, there's no swimming. Um, basically, it's where the companies uh, send all the records, and then uh, this pool distributes them um, to the DJs. And so maybe there's a, a hundred DJs belong to that pool. The comp they'll get a shipment of a hundred records and each one will have their bin. Uh, and come each week, they'll fill out a little feedback for each record. And there might be a stack of records from different labels. Um, you know, uh, just a, a lot of advance and promotional copies you wouldn't get. And you had to be in that record pool to get the good jobs in New York nightlife? Uh, back then, that was really important. Um, it, it was crucial. Uh, it was a click that got jobs. Like a Grand Lodge of disco or something? You just 70s. It was really crucial to be in, in one of those pools. And um, how, how often did you play at the garage? Just one time or? Um, one time was debut? official where it was, you know, uh, advertised. Um, played maybe two or three other times. Uh, Larry said, just play for a while, let me go dance, or, you know, I have to leave, play, play some records, you know. And this was a few years after the war, City Country, City Song, so what kind of stuff was being played at that um, time? Well, uh, I remember. The first record I played at the garage was uh, Lost in Music by uh, uh, Sister Sledge. Um, there was no 12-inch remix. It was just the album cut. And everybody was playing, you know, We Are Family and stuff. And uh, uh, this was the other cut. Um, and I think Larry was impressed that I didn't just go for the obvious. And it sounded really good there. And uh, I remember the time that uh, I played uh, it was advertised. It was the first time I played uh, We Got the Funk there and uh, uh, by Positive Force. And that's kind of a staple for me. I, I, I still play it all the time. You have that with you? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Excuse me, I got a bit of a cold. So this is actually even more than an edit, right? It's almost an, a remix. 
And I guess you didn't do that I'd, with I'd the tape machine. I feel uncomfortable calling it a remix because it's, uh, um, it's a bit beneath that. But yeah, it's more than edit. It's got a little post-production. I, I think that's the best way to, to uh, identify it, just a little post-production. And how would you define an edit then? Um, if we're just talking about editing, um, I, I think that that's all an edit is. It's uh, uh, no extra instruments <coughs> or uh, production values. It's, it's basically arrangement where you're chopping and putting it back together in a different form. And you're, you're pretty well known for doing edits. Um, when, when did you do your first edit? And it was still on this tape machine thing, right? And using yeah. scissors? Uh, <laughs> yeah, razor. Um, I, uh, I got my first remix. I mean, I, was, I felt I was kind of late because I've been DJing a while. And uh, a friend of mine uh, owned Sleeping Bag Records I grew up with. And uh, he was just starting it. And he, he asked me, do him a favor. He couldn't afford a lot of the guys. And he said, you know, can you do this remix for me? And I did his first record. Um, and I was really frustrated because I, uh, uh, I wasted the time in the studio that he had uh, listening to this engineer saying he could do, he could fix that in editing later. And he couldn't. He was, uh, uh, I knew what a bad edit was, but I couldn't step in to do it for him. And, um, Soon after that, another friend asked me to do a mix, and same thing happened. It was like deja vu, and I was just so frustrated. I thought, instead of this helping me, this could probably hurt me, you know? And uh, I went home, and I had a reel-to-reel. -reel. Uh, a friend of mine was um, a top editor for WBLS in New York, and he had shown me how to edit these. It's really simple. And back then, if you owned a reel-to-reel, -reel, uh, you had a a simplistic um, idea of editing because just to put a reel onto the machine, you had to at least edit some leader on the uh, tape and things like that. Uh, so it wasn't that big a stretch to teach you uh, a few techniques. And um, so I went home and I thought, I can't do any worse than this guy. And uh, I was, uh, I had one little reel of tape and uh, I was kind of being cheap about it. I didn't want to waste any tape. And uh, so I started editing. Um, I, was, I was playing at Roxy then, so DST was uh, the big DJ. Uh, and he was very influential on me. He, uh, he was playing a, a funky drummer, really, stuck in my head. So I said, well, let me do an edit of like what he's playing live. And um, uh, I started editing Funky Drummer, and which ended up being Feeling James. And uh, at three and a third speed, which is the slowest speed, it seemed like the, the, just the smallest bit of tape was a big piece of music. So I really had to fine tune it and um, get it right. So a lot of multiple edits, and it was kind of uh, uh, uneven for a while. And uh, so, I finally got it right, but after I did it, um, I felt like I had handled the tape so much that uh, it kind of lost a lot of its quality. So I was noticing a lot of things that I worked very hard on uh, really were dull and um, uh, coupled by, you know, if I gave it to somebody who put it out, it was usually one of these labels, like a bootleg kind of label that. Uh, uh, their quality wasn't that good. And I would run to the garage to bring it to Larry, and he was uh, very happy to test it out. And right in the middle of the record, you could see his face like, hmm, his quality is not good enough. You know, like, it's good at it, but, you know, got to step up the quality. And so now when I do stuff, uh, you work in Pro Tools uh, mostly, um, it's just a huge difference uh, in quality. I retain that no matter what I'm doing. And what did you do back then to enhance the, the quality? <laughs> uh, wasn't much I could do. Uh, try to handle the tape a little less. Um, what was the industry standard then, which is still now, they, they changed the name. Uh, Ampex tape, uh, I forget the name they use now, but uh, 
uh, there was this certain number of 456, and it was, a, it was a thick tape. And whenever I got a tape from someone else that wasn't that, it was this thin tape, and I could only compare it to, uh, you know, a dependable CD that, uh, you know, a professional CD or a store-bought CD, like with a name, and the absolute cheapest, you know, like two-cent CD that hardly ever works, you know. And that was the difference in tape. So I focused on having good quality tape. I had a good machine. We'd clean, clean the heads. And um, I, you know, kind of was involved in the mastering. And uh, when uh, one of my early ones, Love is a Message, I kind of spent the time to make sure the, all the levels uh, of production were, you know, not corrupted. And uh, I was pretty happy with that one. And do you have Feeling James or Love is the Message with you? Um, I don't have Feeling James. I have Love is the Message with me. But um, First of all, I want to show my respect for the edit, because it's Thank you. Um, timeless. Um, you were telling about edits like this were like a blueprint for house music, which is uh, cool. not not the editing. The this uh, type of music, the the uh, pattern, the drum pattern. Mm -hmm. um, for many years, there weren't really any records that. Um, had this very simplistic, straight uh, drum pattern. Um, this is uh, uh, Earl Young on drums, who really did almost the entire Philly sound. And um, he had different patterns that he worked with. And this stood out as uh, a real breakdown and uh, uh, blueprint of what ended up being uh, like house music. Um, you know, and kind of a straight sound. Uh, was it also like the, the other way around? What I mean is um, disco bands performing or playing or recording tracks that were very uh, repetitive and very like straightforward? Um, Did it have yeah, but um, most of the disco bands, if you listen to them, you think they're very straight, but if you try to mix them with a house record, you find out how really off they are. And this particular drummer was a really professional, straight, you know, he was very consistent. And so stuff like this was much more uh, the blueprint for what came later. The disco um, mimicked this a little, but um, really went off into tangents and uh, um, it was after this, you know, uh, most of the disco scene was really after this song. This is like 73, I think, um, right, right around there. Yeah. But I, w I was wondering, I know uh, a, a little bit of the salsa orchestra repertoire. Uh, Same drummer and a couple years later. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, in the Love's Message edit, I did the first piece is actually South Orchestra doing Love Break, mm -hmm. and which is Vince Montana headed that group, which still used some of the same musicians uh, from MFSB, same drummer. And um, no. he. Hmm? Now he does. Or are you talking about back then? Right then, yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, Basically, he was saying, you know, to himself, like, I need to do something in that vein. You know, it's so popular. Uh, so that's where the similarity comes. Love's the message was first. Yeah. And how popular was this? Like, you were not telling us this was popular at the time? But uh, this was underground extent? popular. Ah. It was very intensely popular in the underground, but um, it got a bit of um, public popularity because uh, 
Uh, right then, FM radio was really coming alive with WBLS, especially in New York. And uh, one of the things WBLS and Frankie Crocker focused on was finding music from the clubs and things that would uh, accentuate the stereo and um, different sound than other AM radios stations. So uh, Love's a Message was something he focused on very early, like right when it came out. And uh, so there was a big mass like uh, audience that really responded this right away. And um, this broke this a lot of rules. <laughs> Sounds like the sort of record that if you play in a good sound system will blow you away. Um, it did. There's, there's always this, these legends you can read about in numerous books and magazines about um, 70s New York sound systems in clubs. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, as I, I touched before, uh, the loft really held reign over the sound system for many years. And I don't think it was until... Um, Paradise Garage, it was clear uh, something else had come along because the other sound systems that were good were just, you know, maybe louder or good for other reasons, but they weren't better. And uh, I think um, those two in particular focused on the high quality of uh, sound. <coughs> yeah. And they influenced a lot of other clubs and DJs. And what does a song or a track need to caught your attention of finally doing an edit for it or of it? Uh, I guess I have a DJ's point of view. Uh, I'm, I'm busy thinking about uh, uh, first that I just love the song to begin with. Um, and then uh, I'm thinking about, well, I'm playing this. Uh, uh, how would I change this? Um, if I were playing it, uh, what would really uh, accentuate the high points in it? Um, I don't want to change a record just to change it, but sometimes things cry out to me like, I just wish it did more of this or it didn't do that, a uh, little rearrangement. Um, some of my edits are, you know, as simple as one edit, you know, I just, uh, just want to change a little. Some songs I could just never touch. It, you know, people have asked me, uh, to do jobs for them, can you do something to this? And after studying, I go, you know, it's really good the way it is. <laughs> I don't want to just change it for the sake of changing it. Uh, what, what, would, what would be an example of a song you wouldn't touch? Um, not that uh, someone else maybe <laughs> couldn't uh, improve upon it, but uh, as far as editing goes, uh, I remember uh, uh, Junior Boy's own asked me to re-edit uh, Where Were You? Uh, By Black Sands uh, Orchestra? Uh, yeah. And uh, it was done after, after I turned it down. But um, I felt that Ashley Beadle uh, did it with a point of view of uh, uh, DJ and a dance floor and, and got it right. And uh, I didn't feel that just changing the arrangement was going to improve it. I kind of liked it the way it was. It was very simplistic. So I felt rearranging it is just, you know, uh, not a, a plus. And um, where were you in itself is some sort of edit already, right? It, it uses the trams. Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's a production. Yeah, but... but it's, it's, I, I'd hardly call it an edit. It's a, it samples the tramps, but it's, it's definitely its own production. Um, and... Uh, 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 There have been other songs that uh, I remember when um, I really wanted to do an edit of I Know You, I Live You, Shaka Khan. And uh, I did a very simple one back in the uh, 80s. And um, I just felt uncomfortable with all the different changes. Like, I, I didn't want to hurt the song. And it took me about another 10 or 15 years to kind of, like, I still want to do something to it, but. Um, I finally, with a little bit of production and uh, just a couple of changes, um, worked on something I was a little happier with. But lots of times, uh, I'll just say, no, I, I can't touch this. You, you have Chaka Khan with you, I know you, I love you, or? Um, yeah, somewhere. Uh, actually, it's on the CD. 
And maybe to go a little bit further into the whole edit thing, you, you well, also... Well, actually, it's right in the beginning. The uh, DJ tool. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't think I would put this out like this. Then, um, yeah. um, Mike Clark uh, has a version of that track on the record, of uh, that track on track. Addictions? Uh, yeah, on, on Planet E. He has a record uh, on Planet E with that, that the chorus is the main sample. Sort of a filtered house thing. That was quick. <laughs> no, I didn't know about that. No, it, it's old, like 96 or 97. Oh, you mean it's the original record that Connie West used? No, I'm saying no, Mike, he's, he's Mike talking Clark. about Chaka Khan now. I the know Chaka Khan really record. Oh, yeah? He's, he has that loop on the, on the track. And my question is, uh, before he plays something else, and I forget it. Oh, okay. Um, okay, this is a track that, that filters the, the main chorus, right. which is probably illegal, right? It's not... Um, it's not something that you can actually do easily, right? Take take uh, one bar and and do a whole track right. with it. Uh -huh. um, on one hand, I wanted to know how, how you felt it is like to just pick up. Uh, f I like the track. I'm not dissing it. Right. Uh, take take like a, a like central a yeah the central idea of, of a track and turn it into your own track just by adding a 909 pattern. Uh, I think that. Um the nature of that uh, uh, puts a lot of pressure on, um, you know, how what level you take it to. Uh, I think that's what I was saying. I really liked about where were you, Black Science Orchestra. Uh, basically, they did that, and uh, occasionally I hear some really good things in that vein. But um, probably me in particular, um, the Shaka Khan song uh, means so much to me when I first heard it, that um, I'm probably a little sensitive to manipulating it the wrong way. And uh, a lot of people might say, that's fantastic. And I might go, it's not for me, though, you know, because I'm probably a little prejudiced about songs that uh, uh, I grew up with and uh, have a special meaning to me. Uh, but in general, I try to keep an open mind. I mean, uh, I think, you know, when somebody does a good production, loop of something, it shows their production value, you know, what level that's on. Okay, what about your, um, your re-edit for, for Rocksteady? That came out on Ibadan. How easy was that to re-release on such an underground, small, okay, compared to uh, Atlantic label? Uh, Ibadan's pretty small, and they're very quick to just give me something, and they put it right out. Uh, I think uh, I was a little surprised. I, I actually expected them to license that. And uh, so they're one of those under the wire kind of uh, uh, labels that just feel, well, we don't sell enough records for anybody to bother with us. And they, they got a letter from Atlantic saying, you know, stop that. Uh, and then somebody, I think, bootlegged their record, you know. Uh, so. Don't you feel that these artists who get re-edited and get uh, all these new uh, facelifts for their songs will actually be somewhat thankful for people doing it because it brings their music back into It's a mixed scene? bag. I, I, I believe that a lot of the stuff I've worked on uh, could be viewed that way. Um, but uh, you never know. Somebody uh, could have their own very distinct thoughts on it and uh, be very sensitive to that. Um, I've tried not to get involved with things that I feel uh, would end up that way. Um, and for the most part, they haven't. Thanks. I was saying a message to her, and her and uh, Francois's wife, who's Japanese, said, really? I thought that was always saying, you don't have to love me. And it's just funny how you expect people to know these words. You figure it played so much. And, but uh, uh, I, I think people get a vibe of records, um, but sometimes don't know the words. And uh, when I'm in New York, um, obviously, uh, it's very easy for me to tap into things that uh, have to do with my history and maybe theirs or relative things in New York, 
uh, and uh, I feel I can just hit a button, you know, like I know what, you know, uh, we're going to both react to. Um, when I'm in Japan, it's kind of similar. Around the world, uh, it gets a little more of guessing. You know, I just hope they're on my wavelength. Um, and the place where this worked very well was obviously Body and Soul, right? You, uh, yeah, Body and Soul. You did this for a couple wonderful. of years. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the Body and Soul parties. Well, we did that about uh, six years. Uh, we, we're still doing them at special events. But um, Francois, uh, which I met Francois in the loft. We would just endlessly talk about music. And uh, uh, over the years, he got pretty frustrated with playing out. And he got more into studio work. And when he did play out, he was very meticulous about it. And uh, he called me up kind of frustrated, just, you know, why can't clubs be more like this? Why can't we have a club like this or this or, you know, and uh, focus on some good memories? And, um, and you know, why aren't people more receptive to new music and new ideas? And uh, so we talked more about this. We, we kind of started to build a blueprint of what we thought was an ideal situation. And he called me up one day and uh, said, you know, I'm, I'm playing down at this place vinyl today. It's an afternoon party, you know. Uh, this is, I was telling you about, like, may just come down and bring some records. We'll have a good time. It's not a big deal. Uh, but maybe this is close to what we were talking about. And uh, I did, and, you know, the first Body and Soul party, we had about, seemed like 50 people, you know, if that, and, or less than 50. But right away, um, I got a vibe like this was, what we had talked about, what we want to do. It wasn't for success. This was our outlet to, we could have jobs, but this is the one we would get off on and have a good time, just play for some friends and relax atmosphere, good sound, good records, and uh, together. And uh, it kind of surprisingly jumped off. We, you know, were very happy with it, but uh, it had a life of its own. And uh, we saw it through about six years, and then the, the club changed, and we felt that uh, it had gotten its own integrity that was being compromised, and uh, felt rather uh, leave here, even if we don't have another place to go. And, um, this was a Sunday, Sunday afternoon party, right? Yeah. So uh, this is in some places in this world also quite unsinkable to do a Sunday afternoon party, but. What were, were your reasons to do it on a Sunday afternoon? Well, um, we didn't originally conceive of it for Sunday, but um, what we wanted uh, in the particulars was um, uh, very difficult to get from a club. You know, clubs were not that giving. And uh, Sunday was more of a throwaway day for them at the time. So um, we could experiment. and. Uh, uh, when we got the opportunity, we said, oh, Sunday, that's ideal for us. And the fact that this club vinyl, they had just lost their liquor license. And uh, they were anxious to have someone like us that really didn't, wasn't about liquor uh, do a party there, because normally everything was about selling liquor. Um, so as we got into the Sunday vibe, it became clear that uh, this was exactly the anti-Saturday, you know, it was all the things we hated about what uh, New York Saturday nights had become, and uh, uh, just the tension and uh, bad vibes and you know, uh, the problems with the club industry. So, so what is a typical bad New York Saturday night? Um, well, I mean, you, you get to a club that uh, basically is shoving you around and making you wait on endless lines, not for any particular reason, maybe just because they feel that's what's supposed to happen. Maybe it's empty inside. Um, have security that uh, treats you so badly, uh, they spawn people, you know, into doing drive-bys, you know. And, and uh, I was working in a club where that exactly happened. Uh, the, they're so rude and awful to people that uh, I'm standing somewhere near the door and all of a sudden, you know, I mean, and, you know, like, people got, innocent people got hit because these idiot uh, 
security guys, you know, uh, just were, you know, overdosing on testosterone, you know. Um, and um, in the club itself, on, you know, the Saturday Night Vibe, it's very, we want to pack it in and we want to sell champagne or sell liquor. And it's not about giving you back much. And so it's not much about the music. The music's a backdrop. Um, and uh, it seems just a bad experience. Like, we got your money. Uh, we really don't care if you come back, you know. Uh, and it seemed to prevail. I mean, the real estate situation in New York is so high that it's really just people involved in clubs are just thinking, I want return now. I want my money. And that's the vibe. You feel it when you go in the door. Uh, New Year's Eve is probably the epitome of that. And um, it's a truly bad experience. Uh, so many people that uh, uh, I play for and come to my parties or think alike like that. And they just stay away on New Year's Eve. And it made me kind of start a New Year's Day party, which is quite pleasant. You know, uh, it's the opposite. And um, yeah, your Sundays ended then with a few hundred people coming in every Sunday, right? So it was very successful to do it the opposite way, right? Uh, you're talking about body and soul? Yeah. Um, yeah, no, we, um, it got very crowded quickly. I mean, our numbers were uh, closer to like a thousand to fifteen hundred. Um, the, uh, you know, it was unprecedented. Uh, they, they really, uh, Uh, did well without, without drinking liquor right? it wasn't about that it was about uh, people who wanted an alternative to what New York was so uh, uh, prevalent like handing you so uh, it was the anti uh, Saturday party and um, Paradise Garage hadn't the liquor license either right so would you see uh, it in some different, kind of different period of time um, The garage was just closing to the end of the 80s, and uh, real estate had not um, hit its big boom. It was just starting. And um, uh, lots of people could open up clubs and experiment. They, uh, they didn't have to, you know, uh, like rape you for the money, you know. Um, they were satisfied just to make a living. I mean, the garage took most of its profits and put it back into the, the uh, improvement of the club constantly. Um, nowadays, I mean, it's like, you know, that just doesn't happen. Uh, but you're still doing a Sunday party, right? Yourself on, on your own? Yeah, it's stuck. <laughs> 718 sessions, right? Yeah, which uh, it started in Brooklyn, which uh, their area code is 718, the uh, phone exchange. And uh, uh, we were doing well, and then we moved to uh, Manhattan, and the, the name stuck, so uh, hence 718 Sessions. And it's, it's basically some sort of the same vibe than what you did with Body and Soul? I think um, before Body and Soul, that whole concept of, okay, this is what I've liked so far, I want it to be... Uh, based on this, and that's where 718, when it incorporates all these things that I was talking about. And um, getting back to Kanye West addictions, um, you've been a DJ now for like, what, 30 years? Well, 71, so it's yeah. uh, almost 35. Mm -hmm. And uh, how hard it, is it to survive all that hedonism and temptations of clubland? In what, terms of what still, you, you're still a healthy guy, you know, so how, how do you cope with that, with nightlife? Uh, I think uh, I focused on, after all these years, uh, the community that I play for, which is a pretty positive community. It's uh, more about the music, and uh, I think uh, the music itself has kind of uh, uh, kept me alive and uh, young and positive. Uh, Uh, I think without that, or if I got lost in some other direction, uh, I probably would show a lot of signs of, uh, uh, you know, been around too long or something, yeah. And um, you brought your own mixer with you, and it's, it's a rotary one. Maybe you could explain to the audience what is so special about rotary 
mixers because they are still being the URI, right? Still being used like in almost every club in, in New York? Well, um, URI's when, a URI rotary mixer, when they came about um, in the uh, late 70s, uh, they were so well made that uh, all the main clubs had them. And once they had them, they didn't break down. So they kind of went out of business because they, they kind of sold their, you know, their rush and they couldn't keep uh, putting them out. Uh, so Soundcraft came along and uh, revamped it. There was a need for them again and uh, is making a new one now, which is a replica of the old one. It's a little better uh, in a lot of ways. Um, but uh, that's what I, I really prefer is the Yuri. Um, the, uh, this is a very good uh, rotary mixer for mobile, and it has some similar qualities. Uh, the, when I have to work on a slide, um, there's obviously certain advantages to a slide, but um, uh, as far as rotary and my style of mixing, I feel uh, there's a much more gradual uh, and control over things being subtle. And uh, if I want to work the sound and then pull my hand away, um, rotary usually stays there. I have to spend a, an extra couple of seconds to not leave, you know, the slide very quickly because it, it'll move, you know, and you'll hear that jump. Um, I feel that the transitions are much smoother with a rotary and, and generally better uh, quality. <laughs> Uh, the uh, components are better quality. So sound-wise, you're, you're speaking now? You hear a difference. It's, it's definitely better. And you also have a special method of uh, tuning a turntable the right way, right? Well, I don't know if it's a special method, but I mean, it's what I do. And I feel um, when I start DJing, uh, if I don't do this, um, it was what was taught to me. If um, if I just accept the turntable the way it is, um, lots of times I'll come in and someone didn't know they want the uh, tone arm to stay in place, so they just turn the weight around. It's very hip hop, and they um, have it maximum weight. And um, it'll stay in the groove, but if this is a record you care about, um, it's probably cutting a new groove in the record. And uh, so I like to um, really maximum weight for um, a record should be about three grams and uh, has a setting here. I usually um, like drag along a record. This one in particular, just I found a record that has a, a blank B-side with no grooves on it. And um, what I do with it is uh, I take the uh, weight and I get it to a point where it's, uh, it's weightless but it just manages to stay down. And then I uh, change the number to zero at that point, and I bring it up to about three. If you're home, I probably set it less than three, whatever the suggested thing is. The less weight possible, the better it is for your records, and the longer the last. Um, and then I have to set the counterbalance on the side uh, to the same setting, and unfortunately, which is, uh, this is the most common turntable, um, the MK2, uh, it only goes up to three. So if you need to go a little further, you're a little stuck. You have to actually dial off a little weight. Uh, the newer ones go up to like six, and you can adjust it a little. But once I do that, it should stay where I put it. So, see, this is, uh, I'd actually have to dial back a little weight. But it, there's no groove, so it shouldn't be anything pulling it one way or another. And if you have it off, it'll kind of slide to one way or another. And then just as a double check, after I've done that, I'll just kind of uh, uh, make sure that I'm you know, listening to it and I just pick a groove out and uh, move it back and forth like a scratch or something and uh, uh, make sure it stays in the groove. It doesn't pull to one direction or another. And once I've done that, I feel pretty confident for the night. If I haven't done that halfway through the night, I start skipping, and I kind of have to blame myself I didn't go through this routine. Mm -hmm. 
And this is also better for the sound then? It is. Uh, if you put an enormous amount of weight, I mean, people put a quarter on here, or they turn the weight around, it's like up to 10 grams. You can hear the difference. It's crunching. You look at the needle, the needle is just, the plastic is riding on the record. You know, needles forced down uh, ridiculously. So uh, you, you can hear the mov uh, music being crunched. And this, is a, this was a common or is a common method with uh, New York DJs? Or because I, I have never no, seen it No, it should it be more common. It's, uh, it's a bit of an old school uh, thing. Uh, I'm most likely, uh, most places I go, the sound technician themselves is not paying that much attention. The, the other um, adjustment to make, uh, I should point out, was uh, the, uh, the actual height of the, uh, the arm, uh, this wheel here, um, it, when it's on the record, depending on the felt or thickness, you know, it should be fairly flat. It can lean a little bit down, but very slightly, not too much. And it shouldn't uh, lean up. And so you adjust this um, to that level. And, um, if that's set at the wrong level, that's, again, hurting your records. It's cutting a new groove in there. And, uh, you know, records that you have the weight turned around and it's so heavy like that, I mean, after 10 plays, that would be equivalent to, like this, maybe 300 plays. You know, so you really do hear a difference kind of quickly. And, uh, yeah, before we call it a day, maybe you can play us your own most favorite edit you did? Uh, That's an easy one to pick. Yeah, no. Um, own most favorite edit. Mm. Or do we have any more questions? I don't want to... They're my children. They're steal your favorites. thunder. But I have a few questions. Got a list. Yeah, there is a list. Let's uh, start off. Excuse me, how old are you and what's your weight? Very young. No. Uh, well, I was 14 in 1971, uh, so it makes me 48. All right. Um, what I wanted to know is, uh, all the edits you did, there were bootlegged. bootlegged. Mm -hmm. So isn't it hard to make um, uh, a name and a reputation while you're actually only on bootlegs? You don't have a real... I would say... Uh, in the 80s when I was doing a lot of those, um, I, I wasn't doing it for uh, reputation. Uh, I basically was making a lot of edits that were helping me DJ, just things I wanted as an edit. I mean, Love is a Message, it seemed like everybody I knew had an edit of Love is a Message, but they didn't want to share it. So I had to make my own just to play it. And um, I feel that, uh, uh, Probably, uh, uh, you know, I was sharing this with a lot of my friends, and that's what was really important at the time. Uh, I, they ended up turning into jobs, like uh, um, the the feeling James. I mean, the guy from Polydor used to go to the garage, and he came to me and said, you know, I'd love it if you did that for us, you know, and uh, uh, I would get work uh, because I had a kind of an underground reputation for these things. Um, and they were just kind of positive, uh, um, uh, you know, the way I was going about it. I was just uh, kind of just take care of my friends with it, you know. Yeah, that's actually another of my um, questions. Were there any artists like, for example, Shaka Khan, who'd come to you and ask you for uh, a remix or a production to be a producer or something? Well, if you, let's say, cite some of these classic things I've edited, these artists are uh, so big, if I don't know them personally, they're pretty unaware of me and uh, uh, would not come to me. Um, I can't point to any people like that have actually come to me. Uh, most likely it would be the record label. Uh, and usually the artists, um, uh, generally they're not that involved. They, they don't want to be involved with a remix or edit 
it's kind of, they wince at the whole idea of, you know, what do you do to my vocal? Or, you know, why, why, why did you change the record? I, I did like it. What are you doing? Um, generally, I think I'm, I'm pretty happy with the, the thought of these things as, well, I didn't butcher the record, and they probably would be fairly satisfied with the way it turned out. Uh, I didn't mess up their vocal. <laughs> yeah. but nowadays, it's, um, I think, more or less the other way around. Nowadays, it's like Madonna who's asking uh, um, a tin white duke like uh, Jacques Lucot? Uh, Madonna in particular uh, tries to be in touch with uh, the club scene. So, uh, you know, she's not in touch with me, but uh, uh, she has her own favorites and she will probably will ask that person, yeah. you know. So there is a, a disc revival. What would you do if Madonna asks you? to make her second, uh, uh, her next I, album? No, I'd be honored, but uh, as I said before, there's some things that I don't feel uh, inclined to work on. I would assess it and then say, uh, you know, I'm up for it or not. I don't want to uh, do a job for the sake of work. Danny, just one question. Um, one of these um, latest records uh, reality released was that uh, Marvin Gaye uh, Brown record. Um, and that really has no beat. And, and for me, it's like one of the hardest to play, and, but still most rewarding when you get to play it records, type, type of records. Mm -hmm. And you were just saying you were trying to have things that you could DJ. Um, and personally, I never heard you DJ, unfortunately, not, not till tonight, I hope. But, um, what in your head makes you do a record that's so beautiful, an edit that's so beautiful and that's beatless? And how did you, in your um, DJ vision, see yourself playing it while you were arranging it? Um, well, the thing about that is, uh, even though it's beatless, it's something that, um, when I heard those parts, I felt uh, this is something I would play. And there's parts of my set that I feel um, it's important you know, to not just focus on the beat all the time. And uh, sometimes uh, I need that breath and uh, uh, something that just clears your head. Uh, sometimes in Japan, I mean, I've played gigs uh, in Sapporo uh, 22 hours long. I'm not going to keep that beat there all the time. It's like, you know, they, that Marvin Gaye and things like that are a welcome, you know, breath of fresh air. Um, if you're playing for two hours, uh, maybe it's a little more difficult. Um, but if you have a, even a reasonably long set, it's great to you know have these different places to go. So I, I, I thought of I am going to play this right away you know, when I made it. Can can you please play that for us? And how do you keep on playing for 22 hours? Uh, a good crowd. Um, because with the wrong crowd, an hour and a half seems like an eternity. Um, and you're having a shower then in the DJ booth? And a what? A shower. Oh, in a the breakfast room and stuff like that? Uh, no. It, uh, it's very timeless. You know, uh, I'm so appreciative of the Japanese audience that uh, um, after 22 hours, I was like, do we need to stop? Like, um, I felt sorry for some people who, they just want to stay to the end, but uh, uh, it's, it's much harder for them to dance 22 hours than it is for me to DJ. And you're, you're talking about as a precious hall. Um, I've got uh, three storage rooms plus my apartment, which is the worst storage room. Um, about 70,000. That's quite a pile. Yeah. And there once used to be it's a... not much room for me. There once used to be a picture of your kitchen on the Ibadan website, right? Full of records next to the oven. Right. And that picture has regressed into you could... There were records in the kitchen, but now I can't get in the kitchen. It's, uh, it's just records. So you need a new apartment. No, I need to get rid of some records. And 
my storage places have more room than my apartment. I, I need to, you know, juggle that up a bit. The what? It's all right. Oh, okay, yeah. Find a home. So thank you very much, Mr. Krivik. Very welcome.